it's uh, it's really my pleasure and honor to be here today and to welcome everybody. Um, just a little history about this park, the park we call Celebration Park. Uh, this was started back in 2011 or the, the planning even before that. And this park is in recognition of Romney's 250th birthday or anniversary. Uh, and we, we built this park uh, piece by piece. And um, we worked very hard uh, to put it together and, and to bring it to where it is today. And I'm really proud personally of it, but for the community, there's not one penny of city funds in what you see here. Uh, this was all done through uh, a lot of effort by a lot of people. And to uh, sort of, I guess we'll never totally finish it, we'll always be adding to it. Uh, but one of the things that have been planned from the very initial design was to have the five military seals mounted on the wall and you see four of those here now and they were donated by the following uh, people uh, Dan and Lisa Hallman, the U.S. Army, <laughs> US Army <laughs> United States Marine Corps <laughs> oh my that's bad uh, Ken, uh, Ken John, the, the, the Army Ken Johnson, Dan Rock Myers, Brian Bender and they donated the, the Army uh, seal here. Ruth and Tom Ron, the U.S. Navy, and Richard and Charlotte Fry, the U.S. Air Force, which you see here. One day I was crossing to a courthouse square where I met an old man on a park bench sitting there. I said, your old courthouse looks a little run down. And he says, oh, it's okay for our little old town. I said, that flagpole over there, she's leaning quite a bit. And man, that's a ragged old flag you got hanging on it. He looks up at me with tears in his eyes and he says, have a seat. And I sat down. He says, is this the first time you've been in this little old town? I said, I think it is. He said, well, I don't like to brag, but I'm sort of proud of this ragged old flag. He said, you see that little hole it has up there? That happened when Washington was crossing the Delaware. And she got those powder burns the night that Francis Scott Key sat watching and writing. See, can you see? She got a bad rip in New Orleans from Jackson and Peckerton tearing at her seams. She almost fell at the Alamo with the Texas flag beside her, but she flew on, though. There was Robert E. Lee, Beauregard, and Bragg. The south wind blew hard on his ragged old flag. On Flanders Field in World War I, she got this big hole from a Bertha gun. Ah, she run blood red in World War II. She hung limp and low for a time or two. She was in Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. She went where she sent by her Uncle Sam. She waved smaller ships up on the briny phone. But you know, they just about quit waving for her back here at home. Why, in her own good land here, she's been abused. She's been dishonored, denied, burn and refused but she's been through this far before and I know she can take a whole lot more yes yeah, she's getting threadbare and wearing a little thin but she's still in good shape for the shape she's in so we bring her up every morning and we bring her down every night we never let her touch the ground and we fold her up just right. On second thought, I do like to brag, because I'm mighty proud of this ragged old flag. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. 
I'd like to now invite uh, Delegate Ruth Rowing to come up and read off the list of veterans who are recognized in Veterans Park here. Colonel George Washington, French and Indian War veterans. Battle of Great Capen, April 18, 1756. Jonathan Hughes, American Revolution. Benjamin Haynes, Civil War. Private James William Seville, Civil War. Private James William Seville, Civil War. Guy Hartman, Private, World War I. Sylvester Miller, World War I. Wilson C. Riley, France, West Virginia, World, I'm sorry, World War I. Daniel Heilman, Banana Wars, 1920-1927. Frank R. Hartman, World War II and Vietnam. Private Marvin Hartman, World War II. Chester Hartman, World War II. Sergeant Paul Parker Harmison, World War II. Robert Heiss, World War II. Matt Mathias, 7396-115-2008. Colonel Ken Heckler, World War II, Europe. Herschel Woody Williams, Medal of Honor recipient, Iwo Jima. Bill Parker, World War II. John Dillinger, U.S. Navy. Corporal Daniel Lyle Johnson, Iwo Jima, Japan. Seaman James Stansberry, World War II. Frank Rinaldi, Europe. Sergeant First Class Emerson Barron, World War II, South Pacific. Lyle Kidwell, Army, 4th Technical. Earl Rowan, 191, Tank Battalion. <coughs> Private Oscar Rousey, World War II, killed in action, awarded Silver Star and Purple Heart. Major Hoy Shingleton, World War II. Arno Shingleton, World War II. Tom and Clarissa Shingleton, sons in World War II. Glenn Shingleton, World War II. Lloyd Smith, World War II. Lewis Combs, World War II. Cecil Ruckman, World War II. Seaman Harry Hartman, World War II. In memory of John and Laura Racy, World War II. Harry Davis, Korea. Donald Hartman, Korea and Vietnam. Ralph Hartman, Korea and Vietnam. Richard Hartman, Korea and Vietnam. Mitch Hartman, Gunnery Sergeant Daniel O. Hallman, Jr., Korean Conflict. First Lieutenant William Hott, Korean Conflict. John Dillinger, 1949-1970. Carl Haynes, Korean Conflict. Corporal Elmer Rousey, Korean Conflict. Robert and Darlene Ekved, Korean Veteran. Seaman Donna Hott, 1956-1958, U.S. Navy. Larry Hobbs, 1962-1970. Master Sergeant Dan Rock Myers, Vietnam. Sergeant Ken Johnson, Kalon, Vietnam. Brian Bender, Vietnam. James Gano, Vietnam. USS Arlington, USS Lofberg, Apollo 11 and 12. Sergeant Charles Wingate, Vietnam. Private Margaret Wingate, Vietnam, WAC. Sergeant Richard Hartman, Harry Hartman, Vietnam. John A. Hartman, Michael Hartman. Lieutenant Colonel Kenneth Snyder, Sr. Sergeant Kenneth Snyder II, Sidney Moore, Thomas T. Rowan, ADJ 2, 1965 1968, John Butch Stanwick, Jr., U.S. Navy, Emil Archambault, U.S. Navy, Glenn Cab Crabtree, 1957 1962, Richard Kaiser, 1960 1963, Patrick Miller, U.S. Army, Maryland. Ralph A. Baldy, Colonel Hamilton, 1956-1986, U.S. Air Force. Craig Schenck, 1986-1995, U.S. Army Reserve. Frank D. Miller, Romney High School, in memory of him, U.S. Army. Sergeant First Class Henry R. Lee, Lieutenant Tyra A. Lee, and W.T. William II. 95th Civil Air, For Air Affairs Brigade Airborne, Community Service in Romney, 2010, Order from Chaos. American Legion Post 91 and Auxiliary Unit 91, 
Wapakoma, VFW Post 1101, Romney, West Virginia, established in 1935. Ladies Auxiliary to the Wapakoma, VFW Post 1101, established July 18, 1946. Senior Citizen Center, Romney, West Virginia, Diane L. Smith, Director. Robert Shelley, loving husband and devoted father. Jesus Christ, our Savior, Alpha and Omega. Okay, in 2015, we installed Robert Darlene Ekved for Korea, via, uh, Korean veteran, Herschel Woody Williams, Medal of Honor recipient, Iwo Jima, Sergeant First Class Emerson Barron, World War II South Pacific, John Dillinger, U.S. Navy, 1949 to 1970, Wapakoma VFW Post 1101, Romney, West Virginia, Senior Citizen Center, Romney, West Virginia, Diane L. Smith, Director. Now that concludes our program uh, here at Celebration Park. Uh, I want to see everybody up at the Bottling Works, which will be a, con a continuation of the program. And I might add, which always seems to be an uh, initiative, initiative for people to attend, there's a free lunch there. So uh, thank you for coming, and, and happy Veterans Day. Uh, and just, uh, just maybe I can... I can revive I, or make amends for my slip there. I just want to announce everybody, and there are some people here who know what I'm talking about. Yesterday happened to be the 240th birthday of the United States Marine Corps. Hoorah! Thank you all. the Hampshire County uh, Art Council, along with his acting group, HAMS, which stands for Hampshire Actors and Makers of Shows. Uh, we are going to be doing some special readings. We did some research on Medal of Honor winners and also uh, some last letters. Before I start, uh, I did a little research on Medal of Honor winners from West Virginia, and I thought you'd be interested in that. There have been 71 Medal of Honor recipients in West Virginia since the beginning of the Civil War through uh, Afghanistan. I mean, through Vietnam, I'm sorry. Uh, and two of those Medal of Honor recipients came from this area, and I wanted to highlight what they, who they were. The first was in the Civil War, it was Thomas Ward. Thomas was a private Company C, 116th Illinois Infantry. Uh, he uh, was awarded his Medal of Honor for bravery at Vicksburg, Mississippi, on the 22nd of May, 1863. Uh, Thomas was born in Romney, and um, his citation is very brief. It just reads, Gallantry in the Charge of the Volunteer Storming Party. That was during the Civil War. The second one is um, a bit more uh, involved. This is Medal of Honor recipient Jonah Kelly. Uh, Jonah uh, was Staff Sergeant, U.S. Army, in the 311th Infantry. Uh, he was serving and fighting in Kestenik, Germany, the January the 30th and 31st in 1945. Um, he was born in Rada, which is this Santa Road on 220 going toward Northfield, and uh, he enlisted in the service in Kaiser. And I'd like to read just a little bit about his citation. It says, in charge of the leading squad of Company E, he heroically spearheaded the attack in furious house-to-house -house fighting. Early on 30 January, he led his men through intense mortar and small arms fire and repeated assault on barricaded houses. Although twice wounded, once when struck in the back, the second time when a mortar shell fragment passed through his left hand and rendered it practically useless, he refused to withdraw and continued to lead his squad after hasty dressings had been applied. Now he fought all that day and he took out several houses single-handed where there were snipers in those houses. And then the next morning, I like to read that. Despite his wound, Sergeant Kelly moved out alone, located an enemy gunner dug in under a paystack and killed him with rifle fire. 
He returned to his men and found that a German machine gun from a well-protected position in a neighboring house still held up the advance. Ordering the squad to remain in a comparatively safe position, he valiantly dashed into the open and attacked the position single-handedly through a hail of bullets. He was hit several times and fell to his knees with, within 25 yards of the machine gun nest before he died. The supreme courage, aggressiveness, and utter disregard for his own safety displayed by Sergeant Kelly inspired the men he led and enabled them to penetrate the last line of defense. Thomas, I mean, Jonah E. Kelly. This one is entitled, Honor and Nobleness. Medal of Honor, Nikki Daniel Bacon, Staff Sergeant, U.S. Army, Vietnam, August 26, 1968. I got my boot heel shot off, I got holes in my canteens, I got my rifle grip shot off, I got shrapnel holes in my camouflage covers and bullets in my pot. A bullet creased the edge of it, tore the lining off. All that stuff, and I suffered a major explosion that everybody seen, blowed me in. Actually, probably saved my life. They was tearing me up with machine gun fire, and I just got blown into a hole. They thought I was dead. They just stopped firing at me. Nicky Bacon received his Medal of Honor for bravery on August 26, 1968, while serving in the Tam Kai area. This area in Vietnam was hilly with hedges that, quote, went up like pyramids with hedge, hedge rows at the ends. The enemy was dug into these hedge rows, and we were all out in the open, end quote. Nicky proceeded to knock out three machine gun nests, and then he formed a rescue effort where he would ride on the back of a tank, he would jump off the tank while it was firing, and then he would pull wounded soldiers to safety. In his, la in his words, after his Medal of Honor was awarded, what do Medal of Honor recipients have in common? Integrity is one thing. They are a different breed, I'll say that. Most of us are very humble. I like to think of myself as humble. I wouldn't want to be anything else. You'll find most of them have humility. You can't explain it in words. There's a nobleness you see about them. You see it in some in the military and in professionals area. You know it when you see it. You don't always detect it at first. There is some, there's certain something that sets them apart, even if they are a country boy with little or no formal education. It's not that they are eloquent speakers. That's not it. Something comes out in them when they do things. They would probably be willing to die for certain things and to save others. And it's not because they wanted to be known as real brave or anything. It's something that they just do. You do it and sometimes you think it's over. There's nothing that's going to change that. And so you're going to do the best you can. And as you say adios to this old world, you're going to do it with as much honor as you can. And I imagine there's a lot of POWs We'll never know about it, who died that way. Medal of Honor winner Thomas Kelly, Lieutenant, U.S. Navy, Mekong Delta, Vietnam, June 15, 1969. I kept hearing them saying, he's dead, he's dead, and I'm saying, I'm not, I'm not. Thomas Kelly received his Medal of Honor for bravery in the Mekong Delta on June 15, 1969. Kelly was with the Army, Navy, Mobile, Riverine Force, and his job was to move tri tr uh, troops up and down the rivers and canals using troop launching craft, or LCMs. On June 15th, he was commanding eight LCMs, removing a company of soldiers from a South Vietnam riverbank when one of the LCMs got stuck. About the same time, Viet Cong opened fire on his LCMs. Kelly moved his LCM to the center of the river to shield the stuck boat. He was giving orders when he was hit. Kelly wasn't dead, but should have been. His right eye was hanging from its socket, and a chunk of his skull was crushed. He had wounds in his upper body, hands and arm, and he had been knocked onto the floor of his boat. He was bleeding so profusely his crewmen thought he was gone. With a medic giving him first aid, Kelly continued to give orders lying in the bottom of the boat until all the LCMs were free and were able to evacuate the area. Kelly wrote, They were probably Viet Cong. I never saw them. All I knew was that they were shooting at us. 
and no Americans were killed that day. Honor and nobleness. My section is called Liberty. I'll be sharing with you some last letters from various soldiers, and then I'll share with you about a Medal of Honor winner too. Last letter. Last letter means it was the last letter received from the family and the soldier never made it home. Last letter from Sergeant William Borthrick in World War II. Quote, I'm convinced the bombing of the enemy is having a decisive effect. So we'll carry on until they give in. I don't think that I'm becoming cold-hearted or callous. On the contrary, I've come to realize how beastly war is in every phase of the struggle how aimless and futile it all is to think that in this modern age with so-called civilization reaching a crest of perfection we are rushing like a pack of wolves at each other's throats Unquote. last letter from flight sergeant james dunlop in uh, world war ii firstly i want you to realize and try to even be proud that you have given a man to the cause of human liberty if there is any message which the coming generation should have for mine, let it be a message from us who have fought and died to make future generations of human beings possible. Let the message be this. We have cleared the site and laid the foundation. You build. This time, let us hope they'll take the plans out of that hip pocket. Unquote. Last letter from Private George Henry Davies, World War I, 12th of July, 1917. Dearest Mother, I am now ready for the big push, ready in body, mind, and spirit. I was never better in health than I am now. My mind is just as clear. My soul has been purified, and the whole is in God's hands. If I die, do not fear for me. I will wait for you, my loved, my loved, above all, and for my father and brothers and sister too. I give my life willingly for my country, knowing that it is given in a righteous cause. I can do no more. I give my love to you all and to Jesus Christ, my maker. Military life, which I hate, <laughs> with the intensest hatred, as an unworthy and despicable means of settling affairs. If I live, I shall stand by red-hot socialists and peace cranks to stop any further wars after this one. But while I'm at it, I will fight like a one facing death can fight. <coughs> Best love to all, Mother dear. I will never forget me. Think of me always. Your ever-loving son, George. Unquote. Medal of Honor winner I want to tell you about is a staff sergeant in the U.S. Army. His name was Walter D. Ellers. World War II, fought in the Battle of Normandy, June the 10th, 1944. <coughs> Quote, Man, I'll tell you, until the first bullet is fired when you're going to make an assault, you have all kinds of things going on in your stomach. You think you're going to throw up or something. But once that first bullet is shot, all that stuff goes away. Unquote. Walter Ellers received his Medal of Honor for bravery on June 10th, 1944, during the Battle of Normandy. Walter landed on the beach of Normandy on June 6th, about 8 a.m. as the last part of the first wave. After intense fighting for three days, Ellers and his platoon had reached inland to Goebel. The morning of June 10th, Ellers' platoon was in the lead, fighting in the hedgerows of Normandy. The squad he commanded was in the lead. The Germans had machine gun nests and mortar positions in the hedgerows. Single-handedly, Walter wiped out three machine gun nests and three mortar positions. In 1994, Walter Ellers was invited to be the main speaker on the 50th anniversary of the invasion of Normandy. On the beach of Normandy, June 6, 1994, he spoke these words, quote, Good morning. What a peaceful, pleasant place this is today. How different it is from 50 years ago when many of you and thousands of our comrades approached this shore. What was it like on D-Day? That's the question most asked of the veterans who were there then. 
we will surely all agree that it was the longest day of our lives. The world changed on June 6, 1944, the day the good guys took charge again. It did not mean peace, but it marked the stand for freedom that would continue through the Korean War, the Vietnam conflict, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the Allied containment of Iraq. While we braved these then fortified beaches to beat back Hitler and to liberate Europe, to stop his massacres and to rescue his prisoners, we fought for much more than that. We fought to preserve what our forefathers had died for. We picked up our guns to protect our faith and to preserve our liberty. I'm going to read the last letters first. Private Ivor Roberry, World War II. Tomorrow we go into action. And as yet, I do not know exactly what our job will be, but no doubt it will be a dangerous one in which many lives will be lost. Mine may be one of those lives. Well, Mom, I'm not afraid to die. I like this life, yes. For the past two years, I have planned and dreamed and mapped out a perfect future for myself. I would have liked that future to materialize, but it is not what God wills. And if by sacrificing all this, I leave the world slightly better than I found it, I am perfectly willing to make that sacrifice. Grief is hypocritical, useless, and unfair, and does neither you nor me any good. I want no flowers, no epitaph, no tears. All I want is for you to remember me and feel proud of me then I shall rest in peace, knowing that I have done a good job. Death is nothing final or lasting. If it were, there would be no point in living. It's just a stage in everyone's life. Last letter, William Stilwell, Civil War. Molly, I think of you while the cannon roar and the muskets flash. Never have I been so much excited yet but what I could compose myself enough to think of you. And I have often thought that if I have to die on the battlefield, if some kind friend would just lay my Bible under my head and your likeness on my breast with the golden curls of hair in it, that it would be enough. Molly, I have to close my eyes. It's bathed in tears till I can't write. May the God of mercy and goodness be with you and bless you. Preserve and protect. Guide and direct you and yours always. In the prayer of your ever disconsolate husband. Last letter. Neil Tony Downs, Afghanistan, 9 June 2007. Hey, beautiful. I'm sorry I had to put you through all this, darling. I'm truly sorry. Just thought I'd leave you with the last few words. All I want to say is how much I loved you and cared for you. You are the apple of my eye, and I will be watching over you always. Mary, Jane, Ian, Tom, Craig, Lee, thank you all for accepting me in to be able to care for your daughter slash sister. I will not forget how nice you have been to me. Huh. Bet now my bloody lottery numbers will come in. <laughs> 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 Medal of Honor, Thomas Hudder, Jr., Navy pilot, career, December 4th, 1950. But Jesse was alive and looked as if he needed nothing except a good tug to get him out of the airplane. I wouldn't even have considered it if I didn't know the helicopter was coming because I don't think anybody could have survived that night. It was 15 degrees above zero. My thought was, if I go in, I might save his life. I just didn't think very much about hurting myself. I just felt that for what it was, it was worth taking a chance. Thomas Hudner Jr. received his Medal of Honor for bravery in career December 4, 1950. He and Jesse Brown were pilots who were flying in a group of six in an armed reconnaissance mission looking for targets of opportunity. Jesse was hit by ground fire and was losing power. 
He was able to crash land his plane, but hit with such force that the aircraft was actually bent at the cockpit and the canopies had slammed shut. The other pilots were convinced he had died in the crash. But then they saw Jesse open his cockpit and wave, but he did not get out of the cockpit. They called for a rescue helicopter, but then saw smoke coming from the engine. Hudner, seeing the smoke and realizing that Jesse was stuck in the aircraft, made the decision to crash his aircraft and attempt to pull Jesse from his plane. Hudner attempted to free Jesse, but could not. When the helicopter arrived, they both worked to free Jesse to no avail. They finally had to leave Jesse in his plane, where he died that night. Thomas wrote, all I can say is he was unbelievably calm. He gave me support instead of panicking. Had the situation been reversed, I'd have been saying, get me out of here. And sometime during this time, he said if anything happened to him, to tell his wife Daisy how much he loved her. He really, he really did love her. I just have no idea what was going through his mind. Love of man. Thank you very much.